Welcome everybody to the Music Production Podcast. This is your host, Brian Funk. I make music as Afro DJ Mac. And today I'm talking with Tom Frampton from MasteringTheMix.com. He's got a new book out called Never Get Stuck Again, which I think is going to be helpful to many, many people. Runs the site Mastering the Mix and has some really cool plugins that I'm sure we'll get to talk to. But let's say hello. And what's up, Tom? We'll say hello again. Hey, Brian. How you doing? I'm doing well. <laughs> Doing well. Thanks a lot for Good taking stuff. the time, of course, to do this. Thank I do you appreciate me. that. Yeah. And yeah, um, definitely um, enjoying your work. Um, your your new book is is great. It's super practical called Never Get Stuck Again, a complete guide to turning a musical idea into a finished track. Well, thanks very much. I'm glad you're enjoying it. <laughs> yeah, I I feel like this is probably like the number one problem people talk about is how to finish a song, how to take like the four bar, the eight bar loop and make it into an actual arrangement. Yeah, definitely. People seem to get stuck at different points in the production. And it's, you know, I hear it a lot that, you know, people say that I'm either stuck when I'm writing the chords or I'm stuck at the mixing or stuck at the mastering. And so, you know, having all these conversations and having having explained to people uh, a, a a way of getting through that roadblock at many different stages. I was like, well, the best thing for me to do now, I think would be to compile it all together and, you know, produce it as a, as a resource for as many people as possible. Mm. Yeah. And I see that in the book, you've got it divided into a couple parts and then each there's part one, which is the music comes first and then you move on to mixing and mastering. And yes, <laughs> I think, um, Something a lot of people do, I know I do this a lot too, is I kind of blend everything together where I'm, mm -hmm. I'm writing, I'm composing, I'm mixing, I'm arranging, I've even got mastering plugins on the master channel sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. I'm guessing you are kind of suggesting we really separate that out into discrete steps. I, I would say, I would say to describe the process, you have to separate it out. But you know, each composer, each producer is different. Each artist has their different approach and that's totally fine. But understanding and deconstructing the process is really helpful to kind of say, right, I've got to think about that. That's happening later on. Say you're mastering, for example, you've been through the mastering phase a few times. So you can now implement that mastering phase to your production phase. And you can, that amalgamation of those two, pro those two processes works for you, you know, putting them together like that. And that's great. But if you, I think it's important to be able to, to, to describe them as individual processes before you can put them together. And that's what a lot of people struggle with. Right. Well, I think that the different stages that we all go through, if we're like kind of like these solo producers, uh, in the past were jobs done by many different people. There were lots of... Absolutely. There yeah. were mixers, there were engineers, there were mastering engineers, there were, yeah. you know, producers. Yeah musicians and now we're trying to play the role of everybody in one body <laughs> absolutely yeah i mean the the people that i'm working with these days are just so talented they've they've got so much going on they're amazing songwriters they're amazing producers they also they send me great mixes now as well and it's and it's that development of you know maybe five ten years ago i'd be working with someone who was like right i can play the guitar and i can sing <laughs> And it's like, and they and they weren't able to produce. Whereas, you know, people seem to be uh, trying to take on a lot more of the production process now these days, which is great. It's really mm. good. It empowers them. Um, so, but there's so much to learn. You know, there's so much to it, and it's not simple. It's not easy. So, you know, there we go. I think we kind of romanticize the artistic process, where it's like this. Yeah, sometimes it's definitely. like the divine inspiration. Or you you know you're getting struck by lightning or something, and it like you know the the music comes through me, and you know we get these yeah. like kind of ideas. <laughs> but you mentioned yeah. it's hard work. Yeah, it's, it it's is. struggling and it's fighting sometimes through a lot of difficult yeah. um, obstacles. Definitely, and I mean it's it doesn't really go away either. To like this uh, since i've written the book i i find myself refer e like even myself i wrote the book but i refer back to it almost <laughs> daily like yeah. i'm like what uh, if i want to just really if i'm looking at a new compressor that i haven't started working with before and i want to start playing with it and i just want to really understand you know 
something about the ratio, something about the threshold, just jumping back to the book and refreshing, right? What exactly is that doing or whatever like that? You know, those things can be helpful. I find myself needing a reminder all the time. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> I was just corresponding with somebody about um, learning music and how that might help them. They were they were concerned that um, they were having trouble writing like B sections to their tracks because they didn't know yeah. too much music theory. Which, by the way, is awesome that anyone can write music now without really knowing any music theory. <laughs> it's like a great yeah. like you know twenty first century development. Mm -hmm. But. Um, I started saying, yeah, it's going to help you a lot. But then at the same time, I'm like, but it doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't go away. It's not the cure. Yeah. You know, it's <laughs> it's a helpful remedy. It's like taking a vitamin, but it doesn't necessarily get rid of all the symptoms. Yeah. Well, I mean, can you ever reach the pinnacle of musical music production? Mm -hmm. You know, there's always room for growth. Even people right. that are writing number one hits today or mixing number one records, they're, they're not like, okay, I can chill out now. They're, they're still striving for like, like, how can I get that better sound? Right. You know, better, so, new even. Yeah. Better, new, whatever it is. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, I try to remind myself that if it was easy, it wouldn't be fun. It would lose yeah, the, right? the magic. Definitely. You know, if I could just sit down and be like, boom, yeah. masterpiece, another one done. <laughs> it would just be like, why That's am I doing today. this? Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> why, why am I doing this anymore? You know, where's the challenge? Yeah. I think it sure. is the mystery and the, you know, the unknown and the surprises mm. that keeps me coming back a lot. Yeah. And when you do break through those barriers, when you do yeah. find a solution to that problem that's been holding you back, and then it takes your music to this whole new level, and it's like, wow, it's an amazing mm. achievement for anyone. Yeah. And that never goes away. It's not like, you know, it might be that first time you record the guitar, it might be the 100th time you've mastered a track. <laughs> my dog agrees <laughs> love it love it yeah but you're you're right that um it is like they can't take it away from you they can't take the knowledge away um you know you, you might lose your favorite synth or or your gear or whatever but um the knowledge is so important yeah i, I mean think... the the gear is interchangeable and as you look for those yes. new sounds the, the gear will change anyway so right yeah yeah, the gear is interchangeable, and it's amazing what you can get done with uh, the bare minimum, really. Yeah, yeah, it Some, is amazing. <laughs> sometimes I think I, I almost do better in those situations where I'm kind of strapped and I don't have as many options. Yeah, definitely. Like co um, Confining your choices to a, a smaller variety does keep you focused on, on what's really important. I agree. I think that's kind of the problem that we face these days is that we are kind of overwhelmed with choice and you can keep trying out a new sound, a new plugin, a new preset, a new whatever, you name it. Um, whereas mm -hmm. in the past, you know, you might have just had your guitar, maybe a tape recorder. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so exactly. That, that can be overwhelming. And I think it's really easy too to convince yourself that you need the next thing, you need this other thing. That one more item here and then I'll be making uh, my hits. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's better to call it what it is. It's really fun. Like, I love getting new gear. I love just something as simple as like a, a new batch of presets for a cool synth. It's inspiring. Mm -hmm. It does lead to new ideas. And that's fine. But it like, as long as you know, that it doesn't solve the problem of it, it's not going to be your ticket to a, a, a hit. Right. Information and knowledge is your is your is your fastest ticket, even though it's not fast. Um, but yeah, but it's still fun. Yeah, it's true. You do get like some of that inspiration. You get like the creative jolt. Yeah. And sometimes that's enough to pull you through some of these steps. Well, what do you think was how, what was the last time you felt stuck in the studio? What happened? And I, I would say probably just about every time, if I'm being honest, you know, there's something that comes up, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it's not yeah. always the same thing either. Yeah. 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 Um, I, I try to do a bit of, um, I guess, like forcing myself to start sometimes sure. is really hard. Sure. Um, you know, I, th mm -hmm. I mean, I think about music all the time. I daydream about it. And I imagine if I only yeah. had more time to make more music, what I could do. Uh -huh. And then when uh -huh. I have a good hour or two or four or whatever, I'm happy to like decide that I need to vacuum or I need to, uh, <laughs> you know, do the dishes <laughs> or you name it, like, 
it's so easy to like think of something else I need to do. Or if I'm even feeling like I'm being productive, I'm going to rearrange my desk and my studio and change yeah. the wiring. And um, so I struggle with that a lot. But I do find so getting one, started. Yes. Just like, I mean, literally like yeah. sitting down and starting. That mm -hmm. itself is yeah. actually a big challenge for me. Yeah, and definitely. The um, just kind of uh, forcing myself to do it. Almost, it's almost like working out, going to the gym or something, where you just have to say you you have to make yourself do it. You gotta maybe even entice yeah. yourself with a reward later. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or getting into some kind of routine. You know, yes. with, with with gym with gym workouts or going to the studio. If you get yourself into a routine. And, you know, uh, you sit down and if, if your space is prepared, for example, I like to keep my studio really inviting. So when when I see it, I'm like, ah, yes, I'm going to go and sit down there and I have no other distractions. I can just sit down, I can make music and that's it. Or I can work on my clients material if I'm mixing or whatever. But there's nothing stopping me from that. The from 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 the idea of going into the studio to being in logic with the project open. Right. So I like to keep that that that. Um, that friction, that's like, I want to keep that as frictionless as possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I so agree. if I have a session, if, if I'm mixing, yeah. I'm sorry. If I'm, if I'm mixing someone's track, <laughs> if I'm mixing someone's track, I like to prepare the session the day before so that I'll literally sit down at my computer, click a button and the track's there, it's open, it's prepared and I can just get straight into it. It's that r removing those bits of friction can, can help us be really, you know, proactive in, in finishing more tracks, definitely. That's a great idea. Um, just even like having it almost open in your computer, ready to go. Yeah, it, it kind of reminds me yeah. of um, some advice I was just reading recently about working out. Um, if you want to like work out in the morning, say before work or whatever, um, to set up your clothes the night before, to make the plan, know yeah. what your workout's going to be. So like all of yeah. these, yeah, they're really minor steps. I mean, it's not a lot of work to pick out you know, an old pair of shorts and a t-shirt to get sweaty in. But mm. um, having that go ready to go, having like the plan, what you're going to do really does make a huge difference. And I, definitely, I, definitely. I find um, having things set up ready to go. I mean, as silly as it may sound, like I might decide not to use a piece of gear because I don't feel like running two wires <laughs> from like the input and the output. Do you know what? It's so funny. I, I had a... Um... I used to play guitar a lot and I hadn't played it for a long time. And then I bought a guitar strap and I picked it up every day for two weeks. Something so, so simple wow. as that, that small, that small little thing that I changed to make the process a little bit easier. And, and there we go. So it's about finding that one thing that's stopping that the, the, the one bit of friction is stopping you from, from making that first move. Cause then once you, once you get going, that's it, you have the momentum. And so, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. And I found something similar with a guitar yeah. stand. Just having the guitar out in the living yeah. room, you know, just having it there, I'm a hundred more times likely to play it than if I have to pull it yeah. out of the case and all of that kind of stuff. It's just that immediacy. It is yeah. funny that a <laughs> simple, yeah. you know, $5 guitar strap. <laughs> yeah, I know. Make a big difference like that. What we like. Us, us humans are so bizarre. <laughs> Yeah, and as I'm saying it now, I'm like kind of like, what is the matter with you, man? Like, <laughs> are you that lazy? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like you can't just like open your guitar case. But it's true. Like, it it is a big thing. Um, just that initial like, I'm in this mode now, is is yeah. a huge hurdle. I mean, they do say that like if you get interrupted in a task, it takes you like a good fifteen twenty minutes to get back into it. Yeah. Yeah. I can certainly see that with my music making. Yeah. Well, I just I I did uh, did a a blog post on my website called 19 Time Savers. I talk about the Pomodoro technique. I don't know if you've heard about it where you uh, you work for 25 minutes, relax for 5 minutes and you go back and forth and uh, I I found that to be really helpful. Even with mixing, you mm -hmm. know, a mix doesn't take 25 minutes, it takes a lot longer. But right. if I focus, I turn everything off for for 25 minutes and then of course you know with the with the website and other stuff going on i do have messages emails and stuff coming in so then i do have that five minutes to to catch up with those little bits and then i dive straight back into it but by setting up those time frames it does it does help keep focused 
Yeah, I like that a lot. I I use an an interval timer um, that is mm-hmm. it's, it's designed for working out. It's funny that this keeps coming up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, you can, I'm not a big muscle head, as you can see, but uh, <laughs> but um, just having that those tasks divided up into short chunks of time, I, I find really helpful. Like I'll, I will say, um, give myself 15 minutes to search for certain sounds, maybe if I'm going to work on a project. Yeah. And then it's that's a good idea. it. That's a really good idea. Yeah. Well, I can spend the whole rest of my life going through my browser, 9,000 kick drum samples. Yeah. And you know uh-huh. it, that can be a real way to get lost and to sort of secretly avoid getting to work too. Sure, sure. Um, but when you have that timer, I think it's really helpful. I mm-hmm. one of the first uh, talks I did with an actual like uh, conversation I had with somebody on the podcast was with Ben Burns, and um, he's you know producer. He does a lot of like video games um, soundtracks, and one of the things he said that just kind of like blew my mind and sticks with me is he thinks about how much time he has like per week to work on music. You know, say it's like 20 hours to work on his his music. Mm -hmm. And then he realized what he says is it's suddenly when I only have that many hours, I can't spend an hour compressing the kick drum. (laughs) I can't spend an hour Mm -hmm. searching for my sounds because it's such a huge (laughs) amount of time that I'm giving up. And it just got me thinking mm-hmm. to like, wow, how much time have I spent doing these things kind of like aimlessly, you know? I mean, yeah. sometimes there's a little bit of discovery and learning that takes place, but sometimes you're just kind of like really uh, f- fooling around with details that you have no business playing with yet because you've got a lot more important work to do. Yeah, definitely. I think when you when you see yourself wasting time in the studio, when when I see myself wasting time in the studio, I like to I I try to to recognize it as soon as it's happening, and then I think of a way that I can set in a, a new system to fix this. For yeah. example, if I am constantly looking for a, a a every time I work on a new mix, if the I I, I want to get a channel that's going to be at least a basic starting point for a vocal, and I don't want to start from scratch every single time. So you know. I've I've spent lots of time in the past building the perfect vocal channels for different vocalists. Obviously, they need tweaks for each one, but at least at least a preset that goes right here is four plugins you'll definitely use. Here's three deactivated that you might not use, and that there is going to save me forty five seconds just trying to pick out the plugins just manually. Right. So every time something, every time I recognize myself wasting a bit of time, I try and set in a new system. That's it does save right. a lot of time in the long run for sure. <laughs> Oh yeah, well think about it. If you have, let's say you've got 16 tracks in a mix, that's 16 minutes right there. And then you do that every time you make a music over the course of a month and a year. I mean, those are hours you're talking about. Precious hours. Definitely, definitely. And that's one of the big things we all talk about is where do we get the time? How do we find the time to get to our music? And um, And then how do we maximize that time? And yeah, and how do we not waste it, right? Yeah, But that's smart. Yeah, one of the smarter things I've done is just have an audio track open with a basic channel strip as simple as that sounds. Yeah. But when I, my default audio track opens, it's got a low pass filter, high pass filter mm-hmm. and a compressor. And, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I might need to do more EQing than that, but, um, I'm doing that in almost any track anyway. And it's just to have that there is just, yeah. you know, instead of like finding it every single time and tweaking it. It's just a quick knob turn now. And that's just so much better. Yeah. It's such a simple thing to implement and it's it just saves so much time. Yeah. Well, I think that's really smart to like kind of have that awareness to like, all right, this is something I'm wasting a lot of time on. I do this every time and then solve it. I think I could because use you, you a person. Would, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I was just saying, I think I'd use a person like giving me a quick electric shock every time I do it. <laughs> so then I go like, oh, Yeah, okay. sure. <laughs> well, that's it. I mean, you and I probably, we, we will waste our times in very different ways. Mm-hmm. So what works for me wouldn't work for you and vice versa. So it's we everyone has to be very alert for themselves, really. There's, uh, there's not like a, a one-size-fits-all fixer problem, you know. So. Yeah. I think you're right. And um, 
I, I love the, the what you have there. I've got your list of 19 and I, I was reading this. I think I shared it on uh on Twitter actually. Um this uh, uh, the 19. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I like what you're doing. And uh this is like I'm looking at this and I'm like, I need this. Someone else probably needs this too. <laughs> um yeah. but the timer method is really good. And um it's something like I kind of have moved away from a little bit recently that I feel like I need to sure. uh, start getting back into. Yeah, well, nice. yeah, those habits, they do come and go, don't they? It's like, yeah, yeah, you need to stay on it. It's yeah, sometimes focus. I'm really surprised when I go back to an old session I've been working on and I see little things like, oh my God, yeah, that was so smart what I was doing there. How come I don't do that anymore? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, that's, well, it's good to keep those old projects just to kind of, uh, yeah. Right. But I mean, you, you're, you're DJing, you're playing your tracks live. Do you do you find that you are able to finish a lot of tracks because you're able you're like you're playing them out you get the reception and you, you know you can see how the public are receiving them and you might make some tweaks but they sound great in the club you're happy with how it sounds in the in the studio and so you're ready to release it so do, do you find that quite a good method to to get more tracks out? Uh, when I'm doing performances, I haven't played in in a little while and I've been pretty busy with a bunch of things so. Um, it's been a couple months since I've played out. So I, I, I sure. kind of go through phases though, you know, I'm kind of in like, I don't know, a couple months I might be in the mood to be out playing, you know? Yeah. Um, I kind yeah. of, for whatever reason, I've become a little bit of a homebody. <laughs> so and maybe it's the winter, yeah. you know? But um, yeah, 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 it can happen. That's actually a time when I am very productive in writing songs because the way I perform is um, I usually... Uh, I've got like kind of my live setup where I can kind of improvise and uh, add to tracks as I'm going. And I do a lot of writing that way. And I, I really develop my songs mm -hmm. in that manner mm -hmm. a lot too. I kind of jam on them. I sing over them and I play some instruments with them. And I'll have like my kind of uh, basic ideas for different sections of a song, but I don't always have the arrangement down. So this mm -hmm, method mm -hmm. kind of allows me to just sort of fool around with it and try a bunch of different things every time I play. And then you start to see things that work and things that go together. And it's kind of... um That's great. Yeah, I find myself a lot of times almost working backwards where I'm going from performing to composing <laughs> in a weird way. Yeah, but that's great. That's so good. I think because you're, it, I guess you you might be tweaking the performance each time to suit like you know what's the, the the vibe of how the audience are receiving the song and you know how how you perform that track on the record when you're recording it it could it's probably a reflection of how it worked best whilst you were performing it live so that's yeah. great a lot of, a lot of people do it the other the other way around you know where they'll say this is what I think the audience will like the most they record it and then they release it so it's like working backwards is always a great idea like that. Yeah, it's like it uh, kind of allows things to happen a little more naturally too, where I'm not like kind of sure. forcing my sections along the timeline of my DAW. I'm instead just kind of mm -hmm. feeling it out. And a lot of this happens mm -hmm. without the audience either. It's just kind of me sitting around or or actually standing up. My I have it, so I have to be standing up. I got yeah. and and I tell you what to talk about funny things that have changed, funny little things that change things in a big way. I got a a. It's like a DJ table, I guess, um, but it goes up to like counter height. So I'm mm -hmm. six. I'm six foot three. So like the average table, I'm like a hunchback over, and it's it gets yeah, very uncomfortable. <laughs> so at the same time, though, like sitting in a chair, it's like you know you're not moving as much. So I got myself a countertop height yeah. table, and it did two really important nice. things for me. For one, it gave me a limited space that made me decide on what gear I'm going to use when I play live. I I just said this is my limitation. I can't. It has to fit on here. You know that was just some arbitrary yeah. limitation that helped me focus. But it allowed me to like yeah. be making music and move physically, and I think that's just like a really huge part of it. Um, I've come from playing in rock bands, playing electric guitar, and you know you're moving around all the time. You're you're getting into the music. You're kind of you know, mm -hmm. dancing around there. And I think that connection is really important for me, at least. That physical... Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, like, it kind of... As a, as, as a musician, that. you... Yeah, I mean, as a musician, you have that sense of, you know, really connecting with the instrument. 
and there's some physicality in that and right. there's not a lot of physicality in being sat in front of a computer which is a what, what a lot of engineers and producers are at the moment so hey i mean with vr coming out in the uh, you know over the next 10 years i can see a huge shift coming in that realm yeah definitely yeah and i think you're right and even like if we go rewind a couple years back you at least had the mixing board in front of you where you're kind of reaching and turning things and now you're just kind of like on your, yeah. your little trackpad, <laughs> you know, and you're just, yeah. <laughs> there's no like blood flow. There's no like, um, you know, your heart doesn't yeah. really get to race. And I think that's that's yeah. kind of an important part. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> that's why, you know, it's good. If, if, if you do, if, if someone does find themselves in that situation, it might be an idea to kind of step away from the computer and, you know, crank up the speakers a little bit and mm. walk around the room and experience it like another listener might experience it, you know, try and get that different perspective. Um, and we need to think of other ways that we can remove ourselves from that kind of, you know, obsessing over the trackpad and being really close to the screen and, yeah. you know, getting some more physicality into it. Yeah, because I think, you know, we never get to hear our song for the first time. You know, we all, we know it from the yeah. very birth all the way up to the end. So we don't get the first impression. So I'll sometimes yeah. when I'm writing, when I'm putting things together, I'll let the track play and maybe turn it up and then just start doing something else in the room, maybe reorganizing things yeah. where I'm not completely listening to the song. I'm kind of like letting it just be there. Mm -hmm. And I find that it helps me yeah. notice when things jump out in a good or bad way. Hmm. Because I'm not yeah. completely paying attention to it. And it's just a, mm -hmm. a slightly different mindset. Because again, I think a lot of people that are listening to any music we put out aren't always completely listening to it. It's in the background of a conversation yeah. or a car ride. and um, I think there's some value to that. Definitely. I think that when... We we I try to listen with two different with two, two different points of view. One is the engineer as well, and one is the listener, mm -hmm. and if at the end of a mix, the engineer is still going fix that fix that, then I need to fix that. Like it's not done. If I can listen to it the whole, if I can listen to a song the whole way through, and at no point the engineer in me is like, whoa, hang on, what was that? You know, if I can listen to it and nothing bothers me, it's done. It's good. Right. That's 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 when I feel like I've done my job. <laughs> <laughs> That, that's a good point, too, where you can just kind of enjoy it. Yeah, definitely. That's the point. Yeah. That's the point of music is enjoyment. Right. Yeah, sometimes I find I need a couple days removed from it. It's to, not easy, yeah. To, to get out of that because, um, you know, I, there's like an old expression, right? Like, um, what is it like? If you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you yeah. know, it if sounds about right. Yeah. If you're in that mindset like i need to fix something you're going to look for mm. things that are broken and you might yeah. find something and mm -hmm. it's funny to me how often that the things that i probably would have said were broken become the things that i actually really like about a track like it's the character mm. or it's the charm of that particular yeah. piece of music yeah. even though it's like technically yeah. wrong that comes with experience though i think yeah you know you'll understand you'll have that you have the discernment for what is what it what it what is technically wrong or what is musically brilliant and the musically brilliant has to always trump over what's technically wrong you know if it's musically brilliant then great right yeah, it's a it's a thin line sometimes like deciding like it the, is you know that crack in the voice was that like cool and emotional or <laughs> is that just a yeah. bad take <laughs> yeah yeah for sure I, I don't know that i can always make that judgment in the moment Especially when it's my own voice, for instance, because sure. you know, I'm, it's so hard to enjoy for me, at least, to enjoy my own singing as it is. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, I in the moment, you know, it's very easy to get super critical. Yeah, yeah, it's not easy. No, nope, not at all. Yeah. Well, someone should write a book on that decision making. Decision making in the studio. I'll read it. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think I'm equipped for that. <laughs> <laughs> hey, something I really like that you did on on your site, and uh, it's also in the book a little bit too, is the um, how you like decode some of the mixes of um, yeah. popular songs. People, people, my subscribers really went crazy for that. 
more so than any other blog I've ever done. So I've really? I've just I've just finished another one and it's gonna be coming out next month. Oh um, cool. And it's yeah, I learn so much doing that. And I would recommend it to anyone. I've um, in the book as well. There's a cheat sheet that helps people de- yeah. deconstruct their own favorite mixes. It, they can do it in five minutes. And uh, so this new this that that next decoding the mix, I'm looking at two of the world's best engineers. I won't say who it is, but the be- one one of the best mixing engineers who would then worked with one of the best mastering engineers. And so I'm really unpicking what they've done and their approach to the mix uh, to see what we can learn from doing that. And um, I, I always learn something new from doing that. And I, I've only done a few tracks now like that, like really getting deep into it. But I think it's one of the things that moving forward, I want to do this as much as possible. Mm, yeah, that's cool. I, I think it's very interesting. And, and your chart method is really nice. It's um, how you've got like the different tracks and then you put the little boxes to show when it's playing and when it's not. I think that's, um, it's great. It's It looks kind of like a, yeah, it's a, the DAW, you know. Yeah, it's a simple visualization of the arrangement. And it's like these songs, they are very complicated, but they can be broken down to their fundamental elements. And it helps us understand why these tracks are so brilliant mm-hmm. and why they become so popular. So yeah, it's, it is important. It's, it's, good to, it's good to learn those things and understand what they've done so we can, you know, make those, uh, implement those ideas into our own productions. Right. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of you know when i learn a new song on guitar say for instance like that's more i guess from the, a songwriting perspective less so a mixing and arranging but um well i guess there's overlap but um when you learn a new song you you see what's happening that you don't always pick up on just listening you hear those interesting chord changes or sudden like weird um rhythmic things that are unexpected but you almost don't notice when you're just listening yeah. um so, I didn't I didn't draw that parallel but you're so right. Yeah, it's it's a very similar concept of when you you learn how to play a great song and then you know, you find yourself drawing on that information when you're writing your own song. When I was learning guitar, well, you know, you're always learning guitar, I guess, but um I would learn songs by other bands and like cover songs, you know. That was mm-hmm. kind of the one of the main ways I learned and I never really did that with production until uh, I don't know, maybe it was like a year ago or so I was playing um, I was going to play a little show at a friend's house at a party and I learned um, a song by The Rentals which was like uh, the bass player from Weezer mm-hmm. and you know a uh, little yeah. band that was popular with me and my friends and I did a like electronic music cover of it and it was so interesting to you know, I took the song, I put it in like I would like a reference track. And then I mm-hmm. just kind of recreated each part. But it was, it reminded me so much of figuring out a song on guitar, but it was now I'm figuring out the beat, I'm figuring out the bass line. And, but I'm also figuring out the sound and the mix too. And it was, mm-hmm. it was yeah. one of those like, you know, exercises. It took me like an afternoon. And I just felt like it was so valuable. And it was really, yeah. really helpful in a lot of ways. And this is, I guess, kind of like the pen and paper version a little bit. <laughs> and I yeah, think that's, yeah, for uh, sure. <laughs> I can see that that being like a great exercise to do yourself. Definitely. So I look I, forward. And it never stops as well. Yeah. There's, it's, it's, it's something that I, I imagine I will continue to do for a very long time. Well, there's you no- never run out of great songs to listen to. Yeah, you right. <laughs> the back catalog is insane and the different techniques and it, it all helps. It all helps. Yeah. yeah, that's true. There's always going to be another song coming out and there's plenty to look back on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, a lot of knowledge to be learned from in that way. That, that's, a really, that's, that's a really cool exercise you did. Cool. Well, great. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. So I want I've been meaning to ask you this for a few minutes since we brought it up but um where do you get stuck a lot so is there like a common stuck? sticking point for you in your production process where you're referring back to your own book even I would say for me it's the it's it's getting started with the chords uh-huh. that for me is a real is it is a struggle because I'm not a pianist I I'm good with music theory um 
but it's the music theory is there in my brain, but not in my fingers. Okay. <laughs> so I have yeah. to really think about about that of that those processes. So yeah, that's 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 where that's where I get stuck. But then from then onwards, there's real momentum, and I'm I'm really happy with how the, the rest of the process goes. Mm -hmm. uh, I do a lot of mixing and mastering for people. So, for example, once I've fleshed out a song, then the process is really is really efficient, and that's the bit that I'm best at. Right. So, so and and so a lot of the times I collaborate with people that are better at those things. I, I'm aware of where I get stuck, and I, I collaborate with those people who are much better than me in those areas, and they can really help me get better productions. So, mm. yeah, that's how I like to approach it. Yeah, that's smart to enlist the help. And I, I think honestly, that's a spot where I kind of slow down. I, I can kind of come up with something cool that I like, mm -hmm. and then it's like, okay, now what? <laughs> Sure, you know? sure. Well, yeah. that's it. We're all so different, you know. Yeah. We should collaborate then. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, you, you can yeah. do the work that I have trouble with. And <laughs> and, and vice versa. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, too, it's a, it's a great way to learn. You know, it's um, it opens your eyes. And, you know, the few times I've done, like, kind of collaborations like that with, like, you know, like in, within, like, a DAW, maybe where you're sending tracks back and forth, it's mm -hmm. very eye-opening to see, like, what someone else would do. And, yes. and their decisions and you're kind of like, oh, I never would have done that. And, uh, mm -hmm. and it actually works mm -hmm. pretty well. Yeah, definitely. I always felt like those were like um, some of the better songs I've ever written were when I had a friend and we were kind of playing off each other. And they have an idea I would have never had and that led to another idea that I would have never had building off of yeah. their idea. And it just keeps growing. Yeah. Like, I mean, we talked about a bit earlier where where producers are taking on all of these different roles and that's great but also there is that the element of you know being open to collaboration and saying if there is someone that can help me get this song to a to a higher standard then why not reach out because mm. there are so many talented people out there that and they have different skills to 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 yourself and you know the collaboration really brings out a whole new value in the song that it wouldn't have had before right yeah, it adds like that whole other personality, mm -hmm. whole other approach. That can be quite a lot. And I think it's real easy to get stuck in like ruts and um, patterns of doing things when you're by yourself all the time. Definitely. It's definitely like a new thing as well. Um, one of the other new problems of this day and age is, you know, people, you know, myself included, like, so much more and more it seems like a lot of the music i do is by myself where it used to be so much more with other people mm -hmm. and we become more and more like kind of solo and isolated and i think it's important to find time to get out of that to find time to collaborate and work with others and refresh yeah. yourself yeah yeah i mean it's good to it's good to have have other like friends that are making music as well just to bounce off even if it's just for feedback mm -hmm. you know or like you know what would you add to this or what would you take away i find those kind of relationships and friendships really really helpful especially for the production side of things when i'm mixing and mastering it's much more a you know i'm working with the client and we we might go back and forth a little bit but generally speaking it's exactly what we've just spoken about you know my perspective on what their mix uh, becomes they generally are like, oh, I would have never thought of that. And that's great. That sounds awesome. Mm -hmm. And so, and they do the same as well. They're like, you know what? I'm thinking, actually, I'm going to send you this new snare stem. And I'm like, wow, that's really brought this mix up in a way that I didn't think that it might, uh, that, that it could have been. So, you know, we work together and that, yeah, it's it's been a massive learning curve for me as well. It just doesn't stop. It yeah. never stops. Yeah. It really funny that this just happened, but I just got this little notification on my computer which I usually like to turn these off, but uh, somehow Dropbox manages to sneak through. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just one of my buddies, Mike, just sent me a mix that he's working on. <laughs> it says, through the yeah. board last night, <laughs> dot .mp4 <laughs> or whatever. And uh, it's funny because we'll send each other, like, you know, what do you think of this? How's the drum sound or whatever? And yeah. uh, it's, it's nice to get that perspective. Definitely. You know? so, a, a, a few other pairs of ears that you really trust. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, it's, right. it's one of the valuable things I get. I teach um, a sampling course and an Ableton Live course for Berkeley Online. And a lot of my job is evaluating the assignments that people turn in. 
and that is I, I mean, I, I, it's always funny. I feel like I'm the one that learns the most in my class, you know, because exactly, yeah. I'm listening to all these things and like really trying to think about like what's working, what's not working, and um, what what can I, what kind of like commentary can I offer that's not just nonsense and is actually mm -hmm. meaningful, um, mm -hmm. and it just tunes you into that kind of thinking a lot. And I get a lot of ideas from my own music, like oh, I never would have thought to do that. You know, that was mm. pretty neat. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's music is an art. It's not black yeah. and white. So it's when you're giving that kind of advice, it can be quite tricky. Mm -hmm. um, whereas uh, for, for the last couple of years, our uh, the, the plugins that we've made have been quite technical, uh, like like technically focused. And that is a bit more black and white. There, you know, there are some, there are some debate on a few things here and there, but ultimately, you know, these are numbers and it's like the numbers don't often lie. Mm -hmm. Whereas with music, it's very... It's such a broad spectrum of advice you can give to them. And it's like, if you don't like the baseline, it's not that it wasn't a good baseline. It's just that you didn't like it. It's like, you yeah. know, it's uh, how how do you deal with that? How, how, how do you go about giving that kind of advice? Are you very encouraging to their musical ideas or are you very honest? Well, I try to keep it positive, of course. Like, um, yeah. you know, because they're trying to learn and um, they're trying to grow and I also know that I don't always listen to the same kind of music they're into. So sure. I always try to look for something um, of value for myself even. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but then I try to get to like uh, more things that aren't so much like commentary on like um, personal taste, but a little more like, you know, the vocals are a little buried in the mix here. You sure. know, they're, yeah. they're getting a little tough. There's some like frequencies that are colliding over here. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. I try to look for things like that. And I'll, I'll like always, I find myself with all these like little disclaimers in there all the time. Like, listen, this is just an opinion, but I think this yeah, would be a yeah, cool yeah. thing to try. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and you, I might offer some commentary and I'll be like, well, that's if you even want the drums to cut through the mix. Maybe you want them laid back or maybe, you know, yeah. it's because so much of it is like, you know, a, a subjective thing where it is hard to yeah. say like, uh, you know, things that are like um, kind of shocking in one genre or wrong in one genre, are like the defining element in another genre. So it is mm -hmm, a mm -hmm. little tough to like say anything's right or wrong. Um, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, it's down to the artist. If the artist feels that whatever they've done is justified and it was purposeful, then it's yeah. right. Yeah. That's fine. If, if, it, if it's justified and purposeful, then it's right. If you say the drums are not on time and they go, aren't they? Then yeah, maybe it's time to put the drums in time. But if they were like, yeah, I know I wanted them just like that. They're perfect. Right. <laughs> then yeah, it's like, go for it. And that's a big thing I always have to say to them too, because I'm the kind of guy that likes things to be a little looser, um, sure. a little gritty. Sometimes I like to run my mixes through cassette tapes <laughs> and just see yeah. what it comes out like, you know, I like kind of a vintage lo-fi sound. And mm -hmm. I, I don't always want everything to be perfectly in tune. I mean, obviously, it should sound good, but I think when you're working like in the box and every synth is exactly playing A440 four, four on the nose, mm -hmm. you know, that to me is just a little too perfect when, you know, if I play mm -hmm. my guitar, the A is probably never at 440. <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's probably yeah, yeah. hovering around like, it's it's in tune for jazz, <laughs> right? Yeah, so I I like that stuff, and I think that's a lot of the sometimes even just um, weird things that happen in a track for me are the exciting part. But um, I hear that time and time again. It's like every time I go into like uh, you know a commercial studio or I'm working with an artist that has had a lot of success, the amount the the, the amount of um, attention that's given to character grit. And that kind of, you know, non-perfection. It's so important. Yeah. I agree. Because um, otherwise, why don't we just have the machine do it for us? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That's kind exactly. of how I think about it. <laughs> but but again, like, you know, there are people that I, I see it in comments on some of my work sometimes. It's like, why did you make it sound so like <laughs> grungy? And it sounds like it came out of the washing machine. And I'm like, well, that's kind of going for that a little bit. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, but um, yeah. that's a personal taste thing. So I always kind of try to frame it and let them know, like, remember that this is just coming from me, that I'm no authority on anything. I just, this is just what I think, my opinion. Yeah.
This is what I like, yeah. Yeah. That's a good approach. Oh, I hope so. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so you did mention uh, briefly the plugins. We haven't really talked about that yet, but that's a big part of what you do. Do you want to tell us a little bit if I was to uh, ask you, pretend like I don't know what you're doing already. Uh, how, <laughs> how do you describe them? Uh, tell What kind of things are you into? Because they are kind of technical, but the, I think in it's a very creative way you've done it. So um, well, I'll let sure. you... Sure. Well, I mean, we, we started off with, with Levels. Mm -hmm. So... Levels was our first plugin, and that came about because I was I was mixing and mastering back then, and I had these clients that had all exactly the same problems in their mixes. It was coming time and time again, so I was having the same conversations, and I was like, "How can I, how can I fix this with a more long term solution?" So I wrote an ebook, and that was fine. That helped, but it's it's much easier to get people to download a plugin than read an ebook. <laughs> so. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I designed this, I had an idea for a plugin that would look at the, it would be like an engineer on your shoulder watching over and saying, oh, hang on, you might be over compressing there a little bit, or actually you've, you've not got enough headroom for that mix, or you have too many low frequencies clashing with your vocal there. And it's, uh, it, you know, just looking at the technical issues and warning you if there's a problem, but I, there are, there are other metering plugins out there right now, but they're very much designed for professionals, mastering engineers professional people working in commercial studios and they're not very accessible so you know i really saw that you know people are are mixing themselves they're mastering themselves so i wanted to create something that made making a technically excellent mix or master super easy so that was the point of levels and it, it's been really well received people are really enjoying it i get a lot of feedback saying that you know people uh, that, that, that their, their mixes are improved immediately just by changing a few settings in their mix and in that that's true. Like that happens, you know, if you're, if, if you've crushed your mix or it's way too loud, sometimes people just don't know, they don't hear it until, until they get a warning. So levels gives them that warning and they can fix those problems. And it comes with a, uh, with a mixing with levels and a mastering with levels manual. And it talks through all the processes and, and how to fix these problems in the mix. So, um, so there's that, that was levels. Very similar to levels is expose. And that is a standalone application where you just you drag and drop your final bounce or your mix or whatever into Expose, and it will expose any issues in the mix where they are, and and you can then go back into your DAW and fix those problems. It's like a, a final line of defense quality control tool. And then Reference is our third plugin, and Reference is just a Swiss Army tool of of different features to help you get your track sounding sonically as close as possible to the sound of your favorite mixes. So some I, we've been talking about, people have been using reference tracks for a long time, but sometimes in a home studio, it's very difficult to get your track sounding more like your reference tracks. So we wanted to create some features that would help people understand the differences bef between their tracks and their reference tracks. Mm. So we created this, this tool and in reference, there's something called the Trinity display. And what that does is it will look at your mix and it will look at your reference. And if your bass, if, if your low frequencies are much lower than your reference track, then reference will tell you. And it will give you this visual of how your frequencies compare to your, to your reference track and how the compression in those frequencies compare to your reference track. So you can make these alterations to, to get closer to the sound of your favorite music. And so it has that that has that's really how I use it every day. I mean, I find it um extremely useful and people have said that you know their their track their productions are sounding better than ever we're using this so we're very happy with that one <laughs> yeah it's a pretty cool um th the way you've got it with like this like kind of like purple bar that kind of like just illuminates the areas where there could be some issues um yeah looks great um i've you know been long at um a proponent of having like a reference track in your mix mm -hmm. but um you know you really only you don't have anything visual really to go along with that it's just kind of listening back and forth mm -hmm. and that can also be a little tough to um i guess uh get just right if especially if you know yours isn't mastered yet and theirs is and this is like a nice way to just kind of point out mm -hmm. where like um some of the different uh like the compression levels and the um yeah and the power and the low frequencies. And, you know, I, I know for myself, I tend to have 
I have a tendency to often have like kind of harsh mids, you know, that mm-hmm. kind of cut through a little more than they should. I get mm-hmm. a little bit of buildup in there. And having a reference track is is helpful, but at the same time, I'm not really getting like a visual aid as well. And I think that's a really nice um, thing you've got going there. For because like it's it's important that um, you you as you listen to sound as you're mixing over the course of an hour, two hours, your ears start getting used to things and adapting yeah, and losing exactly. the ability to distinguish high frequencies well that's that's one of the things that i've that i I realized was wasting time in the studio i I realized that if i spent too long without recalibrating my ears and listening to a reference track i was wasting time Hmm. if i make sure that i check in with my reference track every even if i just drop by the reference track for a second every 45 seconds to a minute i know that i'm always going to be on track i'm never going to stray away from the path too far and all that, uh, so yeah, so I, I started doing that and that has saved me a lot of time. But going back to what you said about, you know, when you have, when you're working on your mix, but you're comparing it to a master, that was obviously, I, I spent so much time looking at my Luffs meter, which would tell me the perceived loudness of, of both the two material, of, of both the two tracks. And then I would carefully make sure that they were just exactly the same amount. And that would take me, if I was quick, 30 seconds. So we put this process into reference. So in the top right corner, we've got a level match button. So the level match will literally match the perceived loudness of either one reference track or all of the reference track that you've put into reference mm. instantly. And it's it's perfectly accurate. So now it just, it makes that comparison a lot fairer. Because right. even if you have, even if your reference track is uh, one decibel louder, you'll perceive it to have, you know, richer lows and more clarity in the top frequencies and it becomes an un and you then make incorrect mixed decisions based on that information. Yeah, that's so true. And and that's mm. uh <laughs> I think that's a big problem we run into a lot of times even with just a regular compressor you throw it on a track and yeah. it's got a little makeup gain you're like, yeah. <laughs> but oh yeah, you know, sounds great. It's yeah. louder. <laughs> it's really yeah. all you're really um noticing yeah. and appreciating is the volume boost. And then when you e- even if you do bring down the output how accurate is your ear level matching? Mm-hmm. So, so yeah. um, we've 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 got a new plugin coming out in a couple of months, and I, I'm so excited to share that with you. But one of the one of the features that we've got on there is that output volume. We've got a little pointer that's going to point to you to show you exactly where you need to turn the output volume down to to match the input level coming in, and it's it's super precise, so you can hear exactly what's going on. Oh wow! I, I wish other plugins had this. Honestly, I wish all my EQ plugins had this. It would be so helpful to really understand what was going on in the mix. Right, where you're adding gain and not even really noticing. When you're adding gain and you think it sounds great, but really you haven't changed the sound at all. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Right, right. And yeah, like you said, EQ is a great example because it's really a volume control, just a very specific one. And I do think, you know, it's easy to throw an EQ on a track and do something and not realize that you're actually changing the volume quite drastically mm-hmm. for the mix. Yeah. Um, and you, I think, you know, you run into that a lot when you're soloing things and it sounds great on its own and then. Yeah. But know, I mean, the, the current solution to that is to turn down the output, mm-hmm. but how accurate is that? Yeah. You know, that, that, and it's, you know, so there's a solution to be had there somewhere. Yeah, that would be a nice like standardized feature, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like right next to the dry wet knob or something. <laughs> I'll talk to I'll talk to Avid and see if we can just like ask them to put it in everything or Ableton. Yeah, that would be nice. Thank are you, you are you an Ableton guy? Yes. Yeah. You sound you yeah. Yeah, that's what I use. Performer. I, I used to be um, uh, Logic. I was into mm-hmm. Logic for a while there, which I think you mentioned before. Um, and I loved Logic, but uh, yeah, I live is um. I'm I'm definitely less of a an engineer than you are, where um you know my the fun for me is in like um or or what I like to spend my time doing I should say is like in the creating part in the writing the song part, so um I find live works really well for that mm-hmm, definitely you know um the mixing stuff and you know, mastering I like feel embarrassed to even say that I do but you know like I I I don't uh. I don't want to disrespect the art enough to call myself someone that masters anything. (laughs) (laughs) 
But um, yeah, the mixing is like, I, I enjoy it to a point, but it's kind of like uh, something I have to do to finish my song, if you know yeah. what I mean. Do you, do you find, do you find a, are, are you creative in that side? Like, are you, uh, or do you feel like when you're shaping the sounds, that's very much more part of the production phase, like the phase before mixing. Do you feel like when you're mixing, you've already shaped the sounds, you've already got the tones and the production approach that you want? Well, I think a lot of, and this is something I've really taken me a long time to learn, but I think a lot of mixing has to do with the sounds you select in the beginning, mm -hmm. in the first place. Yeah, de oh, definitely, definitely. I mean, if you, because I mean, you can pick the right collection of sounds that really complement each other and then mixing is easy. It's just yeah, volume, it is. really. Absolutely. But when you start, and I, and I think I really learned this like with having too many guitars in a track, like they're all kind of trying to do the same thing. And then mm -hmm. that gets pretty tough to yeah. to balance that out you have to you you wind up having to sacrifice different parts of each sound like okay this guitar can't have much bass because this one has to have it and then yeah you know i gotta kind of dull this one down so this like higher one can exist and yeah. that then that's that sort of stuff when you have a lot of competing sounds that's when it gets a lot trickier i think the best mixes that i work on are the ones where it's 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 simple it's maybe up to up to 30 stems on a mix and they've chosen one amazing lead sound they've got one main synth sound and a lot of the channels might be just atmospheric or, or whatever but when they've got it when they're going for for example a guitar then they'll have just one two maybe three really great sounding channels as opposed to eight mediocre sounding channels mm -hmm. you know where they've tried to layer the sound to try and achieve what they what they wanted to, but they it didn't quite work out, and so yeah, simplifying it down and and having a concise mix of sounds that you're really proud of, those are the ones that I see that get that have the best sonic potential. Yeah, and it's like kind of a weird irony. That, um, you know, I've always thought if I just kept layering guitars, they would sound bigger and huger. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah. I, I find like they don't. <laughs> they they all no. start sound like a lot of little small guitars. Yeah, and um, definitely. And even with like miking my guitars, um, you know, I'll put two, a close mic on the amp and then a room mic, or if I'm doing an acoustic, I'll have like you know stereo pairs or whatever. And I mm. find sometimes it's just better with just one. There's too much information. Yeah, a lot of times. I mean, yeah. if it's a song that's just acoustic guitar and voice and it's real simple, then I can appreciate you know, a couple mics on there. But when I'm trying to fit the acoustic guitar in a mix that's got a lot going on, I, I don't find it helpful to have those extra channels of, mm -hmm. you know, the neck. And then the, I've got one down here by the sound hole. And like, I just think it becomes too much information. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, that could very well be speaking to um, my need for more practice and, you know, with mixing and stuff. <laughs> but... um. I do think that I find if I think of my, um, when I, if I'm thinking of like uh, the mixing almost like during the arranging, and I'm not talking about like EQing or anything, but just like, okay, I've got like a bass sound now. I've got something in the middle. I need something up high. When I kind of divide the parts that way and textures too, I like to think about, um, then I find things are a lot easier later on. Yes, definitely. Yeah, I think um, that was another that was another thing that that used to bother me a lot when I was producing was deciding the next instrument to use. Mm -hmm. For example, you know, I've got my kick and my bass. Now, what's next? And I, you know, I, I I might pick out a synth that had quite a lot of low end body, and I I would I would be confused as to why it was really holding back the sound, and it it wasn't it wasn't what was right for the mix or for the arrangement or for the production. So getting getting better at understanding what the song needs, yeah, I mean that comes with experience again, but that's so important for for being efficient at progressing a track. Yeah, you know, I had like a a revelation <laughs> where um, I think it had a lot to do with when I started making my live performance setup, where I had you know I'm playing all these different songs within one project. So how do I like arrange my tracks? I knew I wanted to have just eight tracks that I could of uh, pre-recorded materials. So 
I decided, you know, one track would just be drums. Another track would be percussion. Another track would be like the bass sound. And then for the next uh, five tracks or so, I kind of just divided them up by their place on the frequency spectrum. So this is like the lower mm -hmm. sounds, a little bit higher pitch, a little higher frequency, higher, you know, just kind of like that. And yeah. it kind of yeah. made me think of my mix almost like a painting. And mm -hmm. where I have a canvas, I can't put the house, the tree, the sunshine and the man and the, my painting all over here on the left and the low end. Like, cause yeah. you know, I've always wanted my guitars to be huge and thick and beefy and yeah. the vocals to have this like low end presence, but you can't put everything over there. You have to move them around yeah. a little bit. And that, yeah. Yeah. that thinking is like really how I compose now is I think like, okay, what am I going to put in the middle here? What am I going to put up top? What am I going to do on the low end? And that, that's helped me a lot. And it makes the decision of what comes next a lot easier. Because I'm just sort of like building yeah, the... I, yeah, sorry. I think this also kind of leads on to this idea that I'm getting I'm getting more into this idea at the moment of, of framing the listener. So for example, if you want... You're talking about getting really thick guitars. If mm -hmm. you want really thick guitars, then you, you might not be able to have an overpowering bass because the bass yes. will make your guitars seem a bit... Seem a bit... Well, they'll, they'll be thin in, com in comparison. So... If I'm trying to achieve something, I'm thinking, what does this need to contrast against? So for example, if I want a, a chorus to be loud and wide and massive and fill the speakers, then I then the verse is going to have to be a little bit more central, a bit quieter, and maybe a bit more sparse in the arrangement. And if I went for the approach of saying, right, the whole sound is, the whole song is going to sound massive, <laughs> then nothing would sound massive. You know, it's just... <laughs> So, so this, this whole point of contrast and, and reference and, and framing the listener and setting them out, setting them up for something and then surprising them is the only way to achieve those kind of effects. You know, like if you wanted, if you wanted your hi-hats to be really crisp and cutting through the mix and punchy, then, you know, you wouldn't be able to have any other, like you wouldn't be able to have stabby brass section at the same time necessarily, unless they're in a much lower timbre and in much lower range. You know, they have to cut through in that way. They have to balance out against something else to really stick out. Yeah, because and, and this, yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. Um, because these these terms like wide or big or bassy, they're all relative terms. They mean nothing exactly. until there's something else you're comparing it to. I could tell you King yeah. Kong is huge, right? <laughs> until like, <Yeah. laughs> until the planet Jupiter comes along. <laughs> and he's yeah. he's nothing, yeah. you know. But yeah. compared to a, a man, he's huge. Yeah. So I think that's yeah. A big... So if you if you if, re, if you replace King Kong for a snare and right. a man for a hi hat, then right. we got <laughs> yeah then exactly. Like how, and it's something I I just learned uh, really out of a lot of frustration, <laughs> and it's something yeah. I still deal with a lot. Same. You know, um, how can I get this sound to be big? Well, I need to put something small next to it. And I discovered I, th this realization came from doing these decoding the mixes. Oh, okay. I didn't, I, yeah. I, I, and it, because I now I've seen there's there is actually a pattern going on here where they do just that. You know, there's a lot of these these mixes where, and that's what I'm trying to see. I'm trying to find patterns in these you know amazing mixes. This whole idea of you know setting something up more mono and then bringing it out wide and and these contrasting sections. That's that's that is. I believe where a lot of their success is coming from in the in the mixing stage, at least. Mm. Yeah, um, I think it when when you notice it that way, it really comes out in a lot of uh, types of music. I mean, in in mm. like EDM traditional stuff, there's always that part where you know it gets real quiet and the bass is gone, and then yeah. because later yeah. on the bass is going to come in and be huge. Yeah, and I yeah. think back to like learning guitar, like learning Nirvana songs, like. They they did the loud quiet loud quiet thing mm -hmm. you know this this yeah. part's quiet so then when he screams and the guitar is kicking yeah. and the cymbals are crashing it sounds loud but when that's happening the whole time it doesn't really mm -hmm. sound like it's not loud anymore it's just the yeah it's normal that's the volume yeah <laughs> yeah it's it's a hard thing to do because it does require you to make some sacrifices and you know like if you're working on one section of a song you want it to sound as glorious as possible. 
but sometimes yeah. you gotta like you know take one for the team so that the next part <laughs> can have yeah. that power yeah <laughs> well that's it that's that's going back to the whole thing of working backwards isn't it it's looking at the bigger picture it's it's saying you know what's best for this track what what am i trying to achieve from this chorus or this drop or whatever and how am i going to achieve that yeah and that's something i've actually been doing a lot to help with my arrangements because a lot of times i'm working on a section and i just build it up until like i can't fit yeah. anything else in because you know you can yeah <laughs> all right sure we can add an extra <laughs> this yeah. or that here and then I'll, I'll put it all i'll put all those like clips and regions on the arrangement view and start subtracting just deleting taking things out yeah and then that's how yeah. I, I find to get uh you know some better arrangements and then like you said i've got my climax now now i gotta make everything build up to it sure i'll definitely yeah. get there yeah well if that's what you you know by doing that, you're setting the energy of of the climax of the song. So you're saying this is where it needs to get to. So from here, we can just, mm. you know, very organically and musically dial it back for the sections building up and how we're going to drop it afterwards. So yeah, nice idea. I like the idea as well of, of you know, putting more into the, because I've been saying a lot recently, you know, refrain from using too many channels and and work on getting those perfect sounds rather than stuffing the mix. But I guess if you stuff the mix with the intention of trimming it all off later, of trimming the fat at a later point, that's a, that's another really interesting approach that I haven't heard before. Well, it's probably built out of mistakes <laughs> because, <laughs> because when, I'm, when I'm working on something, um, I'll very often just you know try to add everything I can think of because it's fun and it's... You can, you know, um, I can remember being yeah. with my four track as a kid, just an acoustic guitar and a microphone and a four track, dreaming of all the things I could add to it, you know, to yeah. fill out yeah. and yeah. make it huge. And now if I feel like I had seven tracks. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> um, so I'll often just go to the extreme. And then I've got this like really dense thing going on. And now it's like, uh oh, now what? Like, wh where is there to go from here? But at mm. least now I've got like um, the high point. And now we can mm -hmm. kind of like dig down to the bottom in a way yeah. <laughs> instead yeah. of build yeah. up. Yeah. yeah. But I'm finding that to be a little, um, that approach, something I have to be careful of is it becomes very difficult to write like a B section another part yeah. because i've got this like you know amazing super like epic section and then you go to work on the next section it's just like your piano chords dink 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 yeah and you're like, <laughs> like it's hard to yeah. get excited about that switching sure. between the parts yeah <laughs> so i think building them together is um, a good approach to kind of try to come up with the two different sections as early as possible mm. and then build them up yeah but yeah, it's it's funny how um it, like you know in order like you said in order to get wide you have to get narrow. <laughs> yeah. You got to totally. you got to make like kind of sacrifices and it's so tempting to want to do everything in every song. You want every song to have this and every song to have that and yeah. Um, I think that you know if we're still thinking about albums, which uh, I just read an article recently about how the album is dead and you know all that, but uh, yeah, you know when everything's just like one intensity or one path where it starts and it gets crazy, it does again that too just becomes normal. Like you need yeah. something kind of different to juxtapose it. Definitely, and an album it. is supposed to be a journey. It's you know a, a lot of albums are written produced and and created to be listened to as a whole mm -hmm. as a whole work you know yeah song after song after song after song and you know with singles we don't really have that yeah. and most singles now is like the verse is a hook the pre is a hook the chorus is a hook yeah. and then you go back to the verse two which is also a hook and it's right. yeah it's the energy is up and it's not necessarily a bad thing but it you know it's then how do you balance okay this has to be really catchy and you know, it has to have the right amount of repetition with something new and edgy in there. And I want the energy to be high, but the energy of the chorus has to be even higher. So it's, yeah, it is a, it's a big balancing act. Mm. There's a lot to think about. Yeah. And if you especially watch the way people listen to music too, it, it is 
it's so tempting to want to have that 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 hook in every section, that huge part in every section, yeah. because so many people are. Um, I was at a party not too long ago, and someone was playing music, and she kept putting the songs on for like thirty seconds, moving on to the next one. I wasn't even listening to the whole yeah. song anymore. I'm, I'm thinking, yeah. I just read like how the album is dead. I'm like, the song is dead. <laughs> <laughs> I just just start writing like sections. <laughs> I could do that yeah. easy. <laughs> Why I've am just, I stressing uh, yeah, over just like released arrangement? A new, yeah. yeah, just I got released a new, new chorus. Loop. Yeah, a new <laughs> chorus, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, because that's how I'm seeing a lot, of, a lot of people doing it. And you know, like you said, uh, my my nephew is uh, ten years old, and he was telling me he just got a cassette player. I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, that's that's and, the coolest ten year old. Yeah, right. <laughs> I was like, that's awesome. He went to the thrift store and he got a cassette player. Um, and he's like, yeah, like actually have to like listen to the whole song and the whole album now. Like, yeah, that's how it yeah. used to be, you know. Rewinding yeah. was a big pain. <laughs> <laughs> Swapping out the tape, like without that. Well, we have. I mean, the with with Spotify and YouTube, you know, you can jump to the next song so easily. When I was growing up, it was um, my my dad used to buy me a different rock CD every week. That was my education, hmm. and uh, yeah, so I'd have ten songs to listen to. Yeah. And I'd listen to them all. I'd listen to the album, you know, probably dozens of times a week. And then when I had Zeppelin, Bowie, Deep Purple, and all the kind of classic 80s rock out, that was like all I was listening to. I didn't have a thousand songs. I had a hundred, right. like right. after after weeks of lots of CDs, you know. And so my attention was very much on just those albums, whereas now it's like disposable. The the, the Even some of the most popular songs that are out, you know, they last six months in the charts and in in, in people's imagination or in their in their minds, and then it's considered an old song. Yeah. It's considered old news, and they're onto the next thing. So yeah, the music consumption is a tricky thing to to navigate as an artist, but you know, it's yeah. it's all part of the game. Yeah, and and um, I've said this about gear too, but yeah, it's true about music. You were invested in that album. You just spent fifteen dollars or whatever on. You know, you yeah now like you it's so easy next next skip um but yeah when i would buy a cd back in the day i i wanted to like it and i looked for things to like and yeah. i and you there was this idea of things growing on you <laughs> which like you don't really hear people talking yeah about yeah anymore. yeah <laughs> that song really grew on me yeah, like, <laughs> yeah i don't hear people yeah. saying that it's just like <laughs> nah I, I i heard like 25 seconds of it that wasn't for me <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, um i wonder if this is maybe just like kind of a hypothetical type question, but uh, I wonder if um, because of that, like we will have less classic music that sticks around just because there's less investment in and time spent with it because it's there's a never ending stream of music you can listen to. Whereas, like you said, you had a hundred songs and that was a lot. Yeah, and yeah. you would really yeah. spend. Some and I was time into music. It. Yeah, yeah, and you would spend yeah. time with it and really get to know it and learn the parts and the words and, um, yeah, yeah. I wonder if too. Maybe that's why it seems like stuff is getting simpler, at least lyrically. Do you know what? <laughs> I, it's so funny. Um, the other day I was playing backgammon with my wife whilst whilst listening to classical music. And we were discussing the longevity. We listened to Mozart and we we're like, this, this music has lasted hundreds of years. Mm. And we think about, you know, stuff that, that, that we may have worked on or stuff that might have had incredible commercial success, being listened to by tens of thousands, millions of people, and then is dropped either months or even years later. But I mean... Uh, obviously we won't we won't be around to see what which songs that were released in the last 10 years that will still be listened to in 400 years right you know that's interesting i mean yeah who knows how that happened right because <laughs> and that's yeah. not even like recorded music too for most of its lifetime it was not recorded music it was it was it was music. just recorded on paper yeah yeah um yeah, and I think now, like we've got, I I think I'll, I don't know how to how to say this exactly. Um, but I um, if you take like classic rock or bands like the Beatles, you know the the mainstays, you know the people that really stick around. Yeah. 
Um, I wonder um, if we will have things like that. And I wonder if like as people like us that can still remember how we used to sit down with Led Zeppelin for, you know, like a month and like just listen to the one album <laughs> and then yeah. like, it would stay in the collection. I wonder if as we all kick off and disappear, I wonder if that stuff will have the same longevity in the future. Because, mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. if it's because, if it's sticking around because we were more invested in having it stick around because we had fewer choices, what happens in the future when that whole sentiment is just gone mm -hmm. and you can, uh, yeah. yeah, I don't know. Well, I mean, I personally, I love finding new music and there are some songs that I've come across in the last in the last couple of years that you know they're they're on they're in my iTunes they're in my most recently played that you know and they're my they're in my top playlists mm -hmm. and I will listen to them a lot and I I love doing that so I don't think I want to lose that I don't want to lose that um that kind of connection that you can have with just that one song you know I right. whether you you whether you um attribute it to a certain scenario or situation and it, it gives you that great memory or or for what, whatever reason that song speaks to you i want to be able to pick up that song and enjoy it hundreds of times yeah like i did with led zeppelin when i was in my teens you know so i i i'm i'm kind of conscious about not losing that because that's that's a real special connection to music that i've got personally yeah that's a good point i hadn't considered when i said that um, that we do associate the music with the, the memories and the time periods in our life. So mm. in that way, even though maybe it's not that you were invested in the song because you wanted to like your $10 you just yeah. spent, it, yeah. <laughs> it's, um, it's the fact that this happened, you know, on our first date, this happened, you know, when, yeah. uh, when I did that or this, or this was playing when I was driving home that one day. And, um, yeah. So that that like personal like nostalgic connection too is pretty big. So that that's mm -hmm. another, yeah. It's it's interesting. <laughs> How many songs <laughs> like actually get through to that level too? Yeah, hmm. yeah, yeah. And I think that's true. And I, I see it in young people. They do have like things like that that kind of stuck around for whatever reason, you know, because it's some significant moment in their life or something like that. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I had uh, someone asking me, like, you know, uh, every once in a while, I, I want to, like, address this on a, maybe a, another episode of the podcast, but every once in a while I get people, like, just asking me, should I even make music? You know, should I keep, should I quit? <laughs> should I keep going? And a lot of times it'll be like, here's my track. Should I give up? <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's... <laughs> <laughs> but... um. Be and uh, and the reason is often there's so much music out there. You know, what's the point? Why keep doing it? And I always kind of answer the same thing. I was like, yeah, that's true. There's a never-ending stream, but there's not so much music coming out of you. You know, there's no never-ending stream mm -hmm. from you. You know, we all have that, like, individual thing to give. And even if it's, um, you know, not going to change the world or reach everyone in the world, um, it's still... Uh, I still think there's a pretty cool satisfaction in, you know, just listening to the track you created the other day, you know, hearing it and playing it for people and seeing what they think. Like that's a fun, um, that's a fun feeling. That in itself holds a lot of value. Yeah. I think, you know, to, to, to be creative and to be able to get your, to have an outlet to be creative is amazing. And whether the music that you've created, the music that I made when I was, like if we go back 10 years and we listen to that music, it's no good. Like that wouldn't have had any, that wouldn't have got anyone interested. I, you know, I wouldn't have signed it to any record labels or, or whatever. And I wouldn't be able to use that as a portfolio for my mixing and mastering. You know, it's, it's, it's come a long way since then. And if someone had said to me 10 years ago, Hey, this is awful. Stop. Then mastering the mix wouldn't exist. Mm. And that would be a huge shame because I love mastering the mix. <laughs> And it's it's helped a lot of people, and it's uh, it's a good it's a good thing that's happened from from some persistence. So I mean, I would always say to you got people don't have a lot to lose from continuing with their music because it's a it's a great emotional outlet at the very least. Right. And there and there the, the the industry is incredible with a lot of amazing people and a lot of opportunities. And there is financial potential. There's a I I know hundreds of people 
that make their music that, that make their living from music and i have thousands of customers that make their living from from music so so why not I, like, yeah. like i say nothing to lose on, only only stuff to gain it's a great it's a great learning journey and it's a whole lot of fun right yeah it's yeah. it's so true and i think if you even um cut out the whole idea of like whatever result you're trying to get or even if it's a financial thing um that ex just the experience of creating something and um getting lost in an activity um yeah so you have that moment where maybe you know whatever's going on in your life that's troubling you is forgotten for a minute and then you can mm. come back to it kind of refreshed from a different perspective yeah. Um, the process of just doing that is it's a great um it's great for your mind your soul yeah you, you know um there's a lot to be gained from that and i think that's an important thing and i think a, a lot of the people i know that really struggle through situations in life could really use something like that instead yeah. of just being constantly dwelling on whatever's going on and whatever's troubling you to have a a, a little break is mm is valuable and mm. and in something constructive and creative like that yeah yeah i'm glad no one ever said hey man <laughs> give mm. it up tom <laughs> yeah yeah you kid on you're not going anywhere because yeah, yeah it's a just stop now yeah <laughs> yeah it would be a shame because you are doing a lot of really nice stuff out there i love what you're doing i find it inspiring and um there's, there's always a good a good lesson to be learned and or even just a, a good reminder um and it's nice to see um just the uh the book is awesome and, uh, and i i should definitely make it a point to kind of uh promote that here on the podcast that uh, never gets stuck again <laughs> is really nice it's a nice manual just for like giving you a, the road map you actually have a road on it which is kind of cool um with signs and everything <laughs> on the cover <laughs> but it, it is like to have that plan i think you mentioned something about that um maybe it was in, in early on in the in this in the book um I'm, I'm not gonna try to find it right now but uh just that idea of like having that plan and knowing the process is yeah. a really important thing knowing that's why a lot of people get stuck is that they're not sure of the next the next step to take mm -hmm. so if if you're if this is you know the idea of the book was that let's say you're in your studio and you're making this track and you're like, okay, now the mix is sounding great, but it's not filling the speakers. It's not wide enough. How am I going to get it wide? Okay. Jump to the book, stereo spread section of the mixing chapter, right? What's the best way to get these tracks sounding wide without introducing phase issues and problematic um, other things that are going to make the mix uh, suffer? So you just jump to that section, you go, right, that's how you do it. I'm going to implement that right now. Great, this track's sounding wide. I'm on to the next stage. So the point is that they, they, they don't hit, when they hit a roadblock, the, the reader can just jump back into the book and say, right, that's the next step. Mm -hmm. Or if they're, if they're at the end of the master and they're thinking, okay, I'm, I've done everything. Now I'm just working on the limiter. I need this limiter to work perfectly with my track. How do I do that? And... I'm not expecting everyone to be a mastering engineer and have all that information in their head the whole time. It's just, just, you know, you can't expect that. So you just jump back to the book, you go to that chapter, you refresh your memory for, for a minute and a half, and then you approach that limiter with like the, the, the best knowledge just to get the best results from your, from your audio. So, yeah. Yeah. It works very well like that, like almost like a reference, like a kind of, uh, uh oh here i am now what and um it gives a lot of yeah. like nice practical and just like here's something you can do now here's something you yes. can work on yeah and exactly i do think like the explanation of like compression is great the um the diagrams you have are really nice and um and then then you give like a nice uh this chart here that like shows like the type of sound and then you offer like suggestions for the ratio the attack time the release time is practical and it also and that it's aided a lot with these visuals and you can kind of understand now why these are the methods of how people tend to do these types of um these types of compression settings yeah i mean there's there's a lot of information on compression it there's a there's there's a lot to it and that's a that's a 
compression is where I find a lot of mixes fall down because they're such powerful tools. And if you don't know exactly how to, you know, manipulate the parameters to work perfectly with your audio, then your audio will most certainly suffer. Mm. So, yeah, so there's a, there's a fair bit of information on there. And I wanted to make what is essentially a, a, a moderately complex um, process into, you know, easily digestible information. Yeah, it's a nice balance of like the practical and the technical. Yeah, cool. <laughs> and, and I tell you, I've ruined many a good mixes with over compression. <laughs> it's compression so weird. Like you said, it's so powerful, but it's also so subtle too. And um, it, it's best in subtle um, doses, Definitely. I find, because yeah. it all, every like everything in a mix, it all adds up. It all kind yeah. of starts compiling together and building up. And um, yeah, there, there's uh, been a few times when I've, you know, been working on a mix for a long time and then listening to it. And then there was one time in particular that just like was like the saddest moment of my like mixing life was I, I was really like going all out on a mix. And then I just decided to turn off all the compressors and bounce it and just compare it to the other mix that I had with all the compressors on in my car. I was like, damn it. <laughs> it sounds so much worse <laughs> with all this work I did to it. I like worked out yeah. all of the good sounds out of yeah. the mix. There you go. Well, that, but that was a really good exercise then. I mean, I'm painful. I think, <laughs> yeah, but it's good because, yeah. because you're being real with yourself. Right. And that's, that's sometimes not so easy. So, you know, if I, whenever I'm mastering in someone's track, I'll always bring the mix into reference, into the plugin reference, level match it. And my master better sound a lot better than that mix mm -hmm. because you get a lot of masters back. And, you know, I, when, I, when I've been a customer for some mastering engineers, I get the master back and I do the same evaluation. I level match the two tracks and it's, it sounds worse. And I'm like, how that's not the point of mastering. The right. point of mastering is, to, is, is not just to get it to the correct loudness, just but to, but to improve it. it it has to at least improve the sound. If it makes a sound worse, and you've got a problem. If you know, if if the mix was great and it is just a case of leveling, then that's fine as well. But it has to sound at as good, if not better. That's a great idea that I hadn't thought of as a use uh, for reference is to put in your master into reference and compare it with your mix. Because now you yeah. can you can do that level matching. Because a master is usually louder, which is almost always like preferred to the human ear. But um, that that's a really smart idea. I hadn't thought of that. I feel very passionately about that to the point where that when you download the installer, there is a free ebook, which is literally entitled How to Make Your Master Sound Better Than the Mix. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I included it in the book as well. Yeah, it's in there. That's so funny because yeah. <laughs> it's like how not to work on your track to make it sound <laughs> worse. You know, like how to... Yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> it's so easy to do that. It's so easy to... Definitely to just put things on and just even when you think you know what you're doing and mm. and to just kill it <laughs> that's totally. that's a really that's a clever use of your own device <laughs> <laughs> to put your master in there and compare it with your mix yeah i like that yeah i want to give uh people just a way a good ways to contact you so we've okay. we've got mastering the mix i definitely think everybody should check that out um it's it's got uh, all the plugins you know that we've just talked about reference levels and exposed it's got links to the book um it's also got um the book never gets stuck again and it's also got a blog too which the blog is awesome and that's all free and that's all right there for you um and i think you do have trials on the plugins if i'm not mistaken yes i will give you a link where people can get the 15 day free trials of all three plus a free chapter of the ebook as well. Oh, excellent. So I'll give you that link. Did you hear that, everybody? <laughs> <laughs> Check the show notes. I'll, I'll have all this stuff on yeah. the webpage for the show. Uh, everyone can find that at afrodjmac.com slash podcast. And it's also in the show notes when you click on the uh, episode on your podcast provider <laughs> device, whatever. <laughs> um, there'll be links in there for people to click on. So yeah, Tom, thanks so much for spending the time and sharing your knowledge. Um, Thank you for having me. Yeah. It's I've, been a I'm, pleasure. Yeah, I'm really happy to get to talk to you. I've been enjoying your yeah, work likewise. for some time. And um, Thank you. I think it's really helpful for a lot of people. And it's, it's great to hear your ideas on a lot of this stuff too. And uh, I feel like it's helped me become a 
a better engineer just talking to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's a good thing. Yeah. Okay, everybody. So this is Tom Frampton uh, talking to you and me on the Music Production Podcast. Check out masteringthemix.com. And again, yeah, we'll say our goodbyes and then we'll wrap it up. So take care, everybody. Have a good day. Thanks so much, guys. Cheers. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>